Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogefühl. Today with me AJ and Jonas. This weekend we're here in Austin, Texas and I have the key to the all new AMG GT 63S four-door coupe. What can this car do? Let's find... You forgot to say it's a Mercedes. No, no, no. It's just an AMG. No, but it looks like a Mercedes and uh, there's also like the Mercedes star. Well, this car was actually just developed for AMG by AMG. There is no Mercedes counterpart. Mercedes and AMG have always been yin and yang, beauty and the beast. But recently, with the GT series, AMG has taken over the reins and developed their own cars. The new GT 63S four-door coupe is the latest addition. It has the beauty, elegance, and sophistication of Mercedes-Benz. But inside, it's still a wild and angry beast. At its heart is a growling, biturbo V8, capable of launching this car to 100 kilometers an hour in just 3.2 seconds, shredding its tires in the process. So then, the new GT four-door coupe, yin and yang, beauty and beast, a luxury super sport saloon and a track weapon? Let's find out. The front of the GT four-door is very similar to its two-door uh, sibling. That means we have the AMG Panamericana grille, which is very iconic, very low, gives a very snouty, aggressive look. You get multiple different options in terms of the exterior design package. In this black edition, all of these little embellishments and accents are all in glossy black, but depending on the package, you can also get them in chrome. This is a two-dimensional logo, which houses some of the assistance system um, sensors, like the radar. There's a camera up here as well. The 63 comes the standard with the multi-beam LED headlines. This is an option on the 43 and the 53. And of course, you have these two large, muscular power domes. What's under the hood? You gotta wait a couple more seconds to find out. The GT four-door has proper super sport sedan proportions. So you have a long front bonnet, a long body. For ex this is actually five meters long. It's also very wide, has a very um, stable stance on the road. And the roof line is also very swooping and very low. The rims start as standard with the 19 inches for the 43 and the 53. On the 63, it comes with 20 inches, but of course you can get the optional 21 inch rims like the one we have on this car. It's blacked out with the typical AMG logo and these pinstripe black line around the edge. Looks really cool. Also comes with Michelin Pilot Sport for tires. As we go further down the side, V8 by turbo. <laughs> I'm really excited to find out what this engine can do. I've driven something similar, uh, another V8 by turbo, four liter as well, but with a different state of tune in the GLC 63 AMG review that Jonas and I, Jonas and I did, um, I think it was early in the year, or actually late last year. Be sure to check out that video as well. As we go further down the side, again, because of this design package, the frame around the window is glossy black, but you can get them in a shiny chrome accent as well as this accent can be changed uh, to, the, to the different um, options that you uh, pick. The door on the, the rear door is actually fairly long and the front door is actually fairly small. But as we go further down the side, this is something where, you know, this is where the design kind of starts to fall apart for me. I think the front, again, because it's kind of like the two-door GT and an evolution of the SLS, perhaps, I think I really like it. But over here, it's kind of a mix between the end of the GT and the end of the CLS and somehow it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really fit well with me but I think objectively it's a very interesting design the rear tire is also much wider so it gives a really powerful stance to this car what do you guys like do you like this design or do you prefer the CLS or do you prefer just the regular two-door coupe let me know the 43 and the 53 as standard come with coilover suspension with adaptable dampers the air suspension comes the standard with the 63 and is an option on the other variants as well. As you move along to the side, the rear lights are very slim and wrap around the end of the car. It gives that emphasis on the width. Although the car is already wide, I don't know why you need to emphasize that even more. There are some interesting elements like this 
air vent um, here to channel the air from the wheel arches. You can also get an optional aerodynamic package, which will give you some more embellishments um, for aerodynamic efficiency. For example, along this, this will be a little bit more enhanced. Similarly, the one in the front, and most importantly, with the aerodynamic package, you will get a fixed carbon fiber spoiler. In this case, this is an integrated flushed uh, spoiler, which will deploy only at high speeds. But I think, given the fact that you know this car is more for you know, Autobahn cruising, and of course we can't take it on the track, which we will see later on in this review here on the circuit. I think uh, this is a much more cleaner look. Of course, the Mercedes logo, the AMG logo down here, no buttons at all. And down here, a large diffuser for the uh, rear bumper. And we have twin pipes, quad pipes. Although the, the twin uh, separation is only a cosmetic, um, element behind this there is only one tailpipe but at least this is still better than having a completely cosmetic exhaust tip so do you guys like the design overall let me know this large fastback rear roof means that you have a very large trunk as well this is 456 liters of boot space and with the seats down it goes up to 1324 liters that's plenty for a full family's worth of luggage there are certain things which I notice which, you know, I'm not that happy about considering the fact that this is almost a 200,000 euro car with all the options. Like for example, you know, this, I know this is, the purpose of this is very uh, you know, limited, but I wish the fit and finish of these kinds of pieces would be a little bit better. But apart from that, the loading lip is quite high, unfortunately, so you do have to lift your suitcases really high over this and you have to be very careful not to damage this very expensive bumper as you place your suitcases in but there are these metal scuff plates to dam uh, pre prevent any damage from uh, to the top of the bumper so you can also lift this false floor a little bit and you can see there's some more extra sp storage space down here your emergency kit first aid kit things like that there is a 12 volt power socket on this side, some LED lights, some places to anchor um, your suitcases down, some more useful things. And there are two switches here to fold the rear seats down. But unfortunately, as you can see, the seats don't tumble all the way down. I think this is a, a glaring oversight that I can I, I think at, an, at this price point for a brand such as Mercedes or AMG, I wish that the seat would topple down automatically with these switches and I've spent some time fiddling around with these buttons and I can't seem to get them to go down. Maybe it's just this car because it's new, but I hope they fix this going forward. Here we have the key, just an AMG logo, because after all, this is an in-house developed AMG car, like the uh, two-door GT. So really cool to see that. You have the emblem as, as well. So we open the door. Well, the door opens not so wide, but it's interesting to note that it has frameless windows, which is something I find really cool, adds a little bit of extra class. And it's a soft close function with retractable windows let's open it up again take a look at the door the door is actually fairly small it does open pretty wide but it's not that wide there's a lot of interesting design elements like this strip of chrome over here this nice contrast stitching that goes all the way up to the top plush materials here attention to detail as well like this the knurling on this door lock is so nice it still feels really hard and it just just like that quality. A carbon fiber effect inlay over here and a Burmester 23 speaker 3D surround sound system which by the way is just out of this world. For me because I love music and I play some music 
a sound system in a car is very important and this this is about as good as it gets really i've really enjoyed this sound system and that's an important decision when you're buying a car as well so check it out i'm sure you'll be very happy with this another bash of chrome some microfiber style material over here more plush materials down here and of course this being a mercedes the seat control is obviously mounted over here with some heating under thigh support and memory and of course mirror and window and a door pocket let's divert our attention into the cabin first thing you'll notice is that this roof line is really low so you have to be very careful when you get inside you might hit your head as i have several times it is really low but um looking inside it is very cool it's very sporty very black which i personally i'm not the biggest fan of just having a black interior kind of makes the car feel very dark on the inside but really uh really nicely laid out we'll talk more about that in, uh, once we get inside you get a standard a normal sports seat which you can also get with um dynamica microfiber and uh, synthetic leather uh, which Artico synthet synthetic leather which I think is a great option the upgraded sport seats on the other hand are a bit too firm for everyday use and let's be honest even though this is a very sporty car you're not going to be driving it on the track every day and keeping that in mind I think these seats because I've been driving for quite a uh, quite a few hours today are not really the most comfortable anyway let's hop inside and let's take a closer look first of all the thing that you'll notice the most is this large display there are two 12.3 inch screens which we've seen earlier before in some other mercedes cars so nothing new but this car obviously has that the 63 comes with this setup as standard you can get this optionally in the 43 and the 53. the dashboard itself is pretty stiff actually on the top but there are some plush materials over here and it's fairly shallow but I like the way it wraps around you as you can see you know it just wraps around connects with the door so it kind of feels like you're in a very you know cozy cockpit and it is quite cozy in here it's not even though the car is very large the interior space is really not that great but anyway this display as you can imagine there's a plethora of different options and settings and we can make a no one hour video just on that so I'm going to give you some quick highlights um, on the steering wheel there's some settings that you can use to change the display itself first of all the design you have different options such as super sport which has a large tachometer in the middle a sport mode which gives you a speedometer and a tachometer a classic mode and of course there are so many different options uh, to customize this as well you have a heads-up display which gives you a lot of useful information it's also a very large and colorful heads-up display so it's pretty cool course you can connect your telephone media radio you can have your navigation on this as well right now there is no map uh, navigation running but then you can have that on the screen information regarding your trip meter and as you can see over the course of the day we've been able to achieve about 14.7 this is with a generally heavier foot because we were driving on some twisty roads but if you're driving a little bit better um, on and mostly on highways and slower you can expect numbers even higher than this and of course the interesting thing is the AMG performance screen where you can see for example the different setup that you have in the current mode there's the engine is in sport mode the suspension is in sport the exhaust sound is balanced this is automatic the dynamics is the chassis which is the air suspension that's advanced and traction control is on and as you change to the different driving modes this will automatically change and then you can see the uh, you can see how that reflects in this setup as well apart from that there's a lot of assistant systems for example lane keeping assist attention assist adaptive cruise control which will measure the distance to the car in front with emergency braking steering intervention blind spot monitoring rear view camera front camera top down view so on and so forth i can demonstrate that jonas would you mind pressing the brake pedal for me perfect and hold it down as you can see we have different options for just a rear angle you have a rear plus three quarter angle the full side view and always on the top you see a full top down 360 degree view so it's very useful to have this thank you Jonas you may <laughs> let go of the brake pedal 
So, of course, there's so many different options. It's very interesting to take a look at this. And on the right hand side, you have the other infotainment screen. Again, these are just displays. There is no touch. And I will show you how you control that in a minute. But in the main menu, we have all the main options. Navigation, I think, works pretty well, but I think in the end, you cannot really compare any of these car systems to Google Maps, and it's okay. They're still really good. You still have a satellite view if you want. There's a lot of different options you can select for this as well. 3D, 2D, and with weather, and you can put points of interest and traffic details, and you can also move the map around like so. You can zoom in and zoom out. It's not the most slick and smooth to use, but it's not terrible either. And I've seen worse uh, navigation systems in the cars. And this is, I think, pretty good. Nothing great to write home about though. Radio, media, you can connect your phone, mirroring it, of course. You can also have some internet related services with your browser if you have a connection to this. A lot of vehicle settings, which again, we can spend many, <laughs> many hours with. The seats are also adjustable in terms of lumbar support, side bolstering, and you can adjust all of this. You can reset them. There's seat heating as well for all four seats. Um, climate control, energizing comfort. And there's also a track pace. This track pace lets you configure, for example, in a track race, you can have um, for timing, you can also record, for example, the Circuit of the Americas. If you want, you can record your lap times using the app inside. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not driving. Let me try to get out of this. There we go. And yeah, there's a lot of interesting things you can play around with. Uh, it's, a, it's a very useful system. If you want to, you know, get better and better on a track, you can plot, it'll plot, plot um, telemetry. You can decide multiple different parameters like linear acceleration, lateral acceleration, steering angle, engine speed, engine power and torque that is being generated. And it will plot this on a graph and you can compare them. I think it's a bit too much for everyday use. Of course, it's not, it's more for just, um, uh, uh, you know, just more of a novelty item, but it's there if you want. So why not? A lot of fun things you can do with the lights as well. There's a really beautiful ambient lighting system, as you can see on the door sills, even down here in the air vents, which by the way, are these rotary air vents along the border of your, of the two screens down here, everywhere. It just kind of envelops you in the foot wells, a very beautiful um, ambient lighting system, multicolored. You can change the brightness in different parts of the car. You can set individual colors if you want, but they have their presets like this red moon color, which is very pretty, fire red. As you can see, it changes colors and so on and so forth. Color flash, there we go. And yeah, a lot of different options. So I just wish that this was still a touch screen. I know that now the A-Class has a touchscreen. I think all the Mercedes, they should stop with this display system. I understand their, their logic behind it, but I think everybody now is so used to touchscreens on everything from coffee machines to their watches, to their, of course, the phones and in their cars. People are a lot more um, comfortable using touchscreen. And I think in the end that makes it safer. So I hope they make it touchscreen later on. There's a fairly small glove box. Can't really fit too much, but it's enough to keep your car documents. And of course, there's this fragments that the Mercedes cars have that you can put down there and it will slowly infuse that into the climate control to make it fresh. Nice microfiber material over here. This is the glossy black inlay, very similar to the two-door GT as well. Here have your system controls for the climate control. You can turn the uh, speed, the temperature, the vents, so on and so forth. You can also access the menu for the climate control with this button and then you can see what, what you're changing on the, um, on the screen, on the display on the top. You can move that out of the way and there is a lot of space down here. There's a couple beverage holders which you can also remove the, the um, compartment that holds them in place. There is 
a USB charging port and also the place to connect your phone to mirror it. 12 volt power socket, place to keep your phone down there and it closes automatically like that. This is also a, um, a touch sensitive quick menu so you can go to your parking camera. If I keep sliding my finger across this, I can go to navigation quickly. There we go. Or if I want to go to radio, I can just click on radio really quickly. And there we go. So things like that. I think it's pretty useful, but we found that when you're trying to reach into this and pick up your phone or pick up something, you might accidentally turn on one of these settings. This is the control pad, which is what you would use to control the menus up ahead. It's, it's uh, touch sensitive. It has some hotkey functions like to go back, to skip track, to go home. And as you keep sliding across, for example, and you're going to the various options, it also gives a small haptic and audible feedback. I'm not sure you can hear it, but it, there's a small click and it, it vibrates a little bit. Similar to how if you have on your phone when you're typing a message and every time you tap a letter, there's a little bit of a haptic feedback. So it's pretty easy to understand, you know, how many options you've selected back and forth because you feel the clicks. But again, I think they're trying to reinvent the wheel just keep it a touchscreen and you don't have to worry about all of this fancy stuff. This is the AMG shifter for the 9-speed TCT. Of course, it's really small. It's good to keep your hand on top of this when you're operating this uh, screen. Sorry, this um, touchpad, so it's pretty useful that way. And of course, there are paddle shifters on the steering wheel. I'll show you that in a minute. But this section is pretty cool. This kind of mimics the V8 engine under the hood. That's why we have 4 and 4 and it's kind of like how the uh, the V8 looks on the top from the top. This is a rocker switch to select the different driving modes. There's a little screen beside each one which shows you what it is. So for example, a slow mode for slippery conditions, individual, comfort, sport, sport plus and race. This is if you push this to turn from automatic to a fully manually operated um, gearbox. And if, even if you have it in race mode, you can always change this, the damping to com comfort so that you can still get the great performance that you have, but keep the, the chassis in a comfortable uh, setting. Traction control, the exhaust as well. If you want to make some noise, but you want the car to be in comfort mode, you can just enable that with this button to deploy the spoiler, volume control, and power uh, engine auto shut off. This also, we found that this has a little bit of a delayed reaction and in the end, we wish that this was a knob, and I think it would be much easier just to have a knob for the volume. As we go further towards the side, there is another cubby hole with an SD card, a couple more USB charging ports, and some place to perhaps strap down your phone or an iPad, or not an iPad, but like a small device down there. The steering wheel, I think, is a great highlight. It kind of lifts the cabin and makes it very sporty just because of this steering wheel design. First of all, it's very squared off along the edges, which makes it very sporty, kind of like a Formula One car. You have a stripe on the top to show you top dead center, which honestly is not useful, but it's again cool. Contrast stitching, this has the microfiber um, Alcantara type um, material, so it's really grippy. A chrome accent along the central section a touch sensitive controller over here as well as over here. This is to get through the menus on the screen. And this is to control the speed limiter versus the adaptive cruise control. You can use that to set the speed and cancel and reset and also set the distance with the car in front. This is for operating your menu over here, volume, telephony controls as well. In addition to that, you have two really cool looking uh, but, uh, control panels over here. This is to automatically just switch to a loud or quiet exhaust, irrespective of the driving profile that you're in. And similarly, this is to change the sports, sus the suspension setup um, with a quick button. So you can put it in race mode and then just turn off the loud exhaust and put the engine, put the suspension into comfort and still have a sharp handling and sharp uh, throttle response. And speaking of the driving profiles, you can select them on this rocker, sorry, this uh, knob, very similar to the Porsche um, uh, steering wheel, which also has this kind of a system. 
but here you can see it's a small mini display. You can also press this to go, go back to the top and um, change the settings. And of course, paddle shifters for the gearbox. All right, let's take a look at the back. The door opens fairly wide. It is very similar in terms of design and materials to the front door. Also has a frameless window and a soft close function. Getting inside, like the front, is a bit tricky because the roof is very, very low. Soft close, window goes up. And yes, I think that the space in the back is not that great. The space overall is a bit tight. In fact, I think the Panamera, which I did drive, unfortunately, we don't have a review. I don't have a review, but we can see, you can watch the other reviews um, that our team has done. I think there's a little bit more space in the Panamera, but it's not terrible. And again, it's better than the CLS, for example. This seat is set to my driving position. I'm five foot eight or 1.7 meters. Knee room is adequate. The seat is really low, so it is tight. I cannot really slide my feet under the front seat, but if it was a little bit raised, I could. Head, head space is pretty decent, pretty adequate. The seats are also fairly comfortable. I would say a little bit more comfortable than the front sports seats, actually. So that's nice to see. I also have air vents and two separate climate zones for the left and right passenger, along with heated seats as well for the back passengers. This rear bench, actually, you can get in different options. You can get a, you can have a, a three-seater like this with um, adjustable head restraints and a central armrest um, like this. Or you can also have two captain seats. And I think perhaps that would be better. There you have a more separated uh, two seats in the back with a more elaborate central console with more charging points and things like that. And the middle seat, let me just check it out. It's okay in terms of the base is quite soft. The armrest with that plastic cup holder does make it a bit firm, but the central transmission tunnel means that I have no place to keep my legs but to impede in my co-passenger's foot wells, which is already quite limited. And this is Jonas's seating position. This is all the way back. Jonas, how tall are you? One meter 93, so he's a tall guy, and this is how he was sitting. I could probably just about fit inside here, but as you can see, if you really want a large, luxurious, fast family car, the AMG GT four-door, unfortunately, does not really meet that too much, which I think is a little bit of a, of a hit and miss, because it's a great performance car, but the fact that it's a four-door and to compete with the cars like the Panamera, I think it should have paid a little bit more attention to the back seat and the overall space. But at least you get Isofix points for child seats and these really cool yellow seat belts all around. Let's see what powers this beast. <laughs> wow. But let's take a step back. First of all, gas charge struts. Acoustic damping, of course. So, the GT four-door coupe is available with two engines and four states of tune. The first engine would be on the AMG GT 43 and the 53. This is a three-liter three inline-six turbo petrol engine with an electric auxiliary compressor called the EQ Boost. This is a mild hybrid system, so the electric motor assists the engine and helps give a little bit of extra boost when it's required, up to 22 horsepower. The base 43 has 367 horsepower and 500 newton meters of torque. Then we have this the AMG 4 liter bi turbo V8 petrol engine. And the 63S, which is the most powerful one, the one we have here, makes 639 horsepower and 900 newton meters of torque. <laughs> That's incredible. So you might know this engine, it's fairly familiar, and of course, they're always developing it ever so slightly for each iteration. So the two turbochargers are nestled within the bank. So there's one bank here, four cylinders, and another bank here, hence making the V8. And the turbos are actually right between the two banks. You can see them here. And these are twin turbos, so there's two, one for each bank, but these are also twin scroll. So two twin scroll turbos. Of course, this is mounted a little bit behind the front of the car, so it is on top of the rear of the front axle. Um, it's longitudinally mounted. 
it goes through a AMG SpeedShift MCT 9-speed transmission through uh, a 4MATIC Plus all-wheel drive system. So, let's go back one more step. There's a lot to talk about here. The 43 and 53 come with the AMG SpeedShift TCT 9-speed auto, uh, automatic transmission. And this comes with the MCT. The MCT is the multi-plate wet clutch. The 4MATIC Plus, in this case, is a rare biased torque variable uh, all-wheel drive system. So, which means that it's rear wheel drive biased. There's also a electronic locking differential, a limited slip differential for the 63s, where the 43 and the 53 get a mechanical LSD. And the, the 4MATIC Plus system works the same way in both of these cars. So it's always varying torque between the front and the rear axle. And it's an on-demand front wheel um, uh, power uh, delivery. So you can have this running as a purely rear wheel drive car if you want. And when it's needed, it will transfer power to the front wheels automatically. A lot of words, but what does it result in? Well, this 63S goes from 0 to 100 in 3.2 seconds and can, has a top speed of 315 kilometers per hour. Wow. Some headline figures to start with. 639 horsepower, 900 newton meters of torque, 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 3.2 seconds, and a top speed of over 315 kilometers per hour. That good enough for you? Well, it is definitely good enough for me. To unleash the beast within the beauty, first let's use the rotary dial on the steering wheel to change from comfort to sport, then sport plus. I'm gonna keep the race mode for the racetrack as it is designed to be for the racetrack and it's not that safe to use it on public roads. I'm gonna leave the traction control on as well and I'm gonna just put the spoiler up for fun. And let's also change it to manual mode. There's a car behind me, so I'm gonna slow down a little bit, but let's just do a quick uh, acceleration test. So let's see, how about right here? I'm going at, I'll drop it down to about 20 miles per hour. Put my foot down, here we go. <laughs> this car has immediate responses. It's incredible. That bi-turbo V8 is just so smooth and so silky. So that 900 Newton meters, you have that to play with almost everywhere in the torque uh, in the in the power band and that noise is just addictive every time you let off the throttle it just spits and crackles it's so engaging the shifts are also instant with these paddle shifters that you have you can shift up and shift down steering feel in sport plus mode is also impeccable it gives you such great feedback oh man <laughs> And let's put it, the engine, uh, the gear, gearbox in manual mode. Drop it down to first gear. <laughs> Whoa! It's incredible. The acceleration is just visceral. Just throws you in the back of the seat. And it's, I really like the display. It gives you that flashing red uh, signal for you to shift up when you're hitting the red line which, by the way, comes so quickly. Okay, I don't want to break the law, so I'm going to slow down a little bit and let's break it down piece by piece. So this engine, well, even though it doesn't have an EQ boost, it is so sharp, thanks to that bi-turbo. You have torque pretty much throughout the rev range. Like I said, 900 Newton meters, that's enough to stop the Earth from rotating. Then the steering, well, this steering is so progressive. You have such great feedback. You can choose the different uh, settings and accordingly, uh, according to the driving uh, profile, it will become heavier and it gives you more um, feedback as well. The grip is also really nice, thanks to this Alcantara material. It's squared off, very sporty. You have the dead center uh, uh, 
st uh, strip on the top as well, which in truth doesn't really make a difference out on the road, but it's just cool to have. Very sharp responses. Then the chassis, well, this car weighs a lot. This is 2,000 kilograms. So it is, it is, you can feel that weight a little bit, but the 63 comes a standard with air suspension, and this really helps mask that weight so well around corners. It pushes down on the outside wheels and gives some slack on the inside wheels and maintains such a great flat composure through corners at any speed that you forget that you're driving such a big car. You don't really feel the length as well, it's five meters long, but you do feel the width. And American roads are pretty wide, but I can already tell you that on some narrow roads like this, as beautiful as they are, <laughs> it is, it does feel a bit, it does feel a bit wide. But the turn-in is so sharp, thanks to rear axle steering. So at speeds up to 100 kilometers per hour, the rear wheels turn in opposite directions to effectively uh, reduce the turning radius of the car. So it, you can turn in really sharp, like so. At speeds over 100 kilometers per hour, the rear axle turns ever so slightly in the same direction as the front wheels to um, virtually extend the wheelbase. And this gives you more stability at higher speeds going around corners. But on twisty roads like this, when you're not going to be crossing that much of a, crossing 100 kilometers per hour, it gives you such a great control over the car. It makes it feel like you're driving something so much smaller. Of course, if you really do want to let the tail kick out, it can. This 4Matic Plus, even though it is a four-wheel drive, it is rear wheel biased. So you can have it only in rear wheel. It only does send some power to the front as and when required. <laughs> There's so many interesting gauges as well that you can use when you're driving, um, especially in this sporty mode. You have things like, you know, you can see the amount of boost that you're getting, um, the amount of power and torque at the, that the car is generating at that moment in time. So you can really have so much fun. You can also get a G meter. So there's a, a graph which would plot the G forces for you. So you can see, you know, well, you can feel the G forces, of course, but it's just, this is something common. A lot of cars have this, you know, it's kind of the, you, it's a must have for sporty cars. The Porsches have them, um, the GTR has it. A lot of these sports cars have these kinds of G meters and boost gauges and things like that. <laughs> I'm never gonna get tired of this. But yeah, overall, it's so much more fun than you would think because it does look heavy, it does look big, but it doesn't feel big. And that's a good thing. Before we get to the track, let's have a look at how the new GT four-door coupe behaves on city roads as well as on the highway. To demonstrate that even though this car has rear axle steering, you still need to do a three-point turn I have to turn around now and you can see that even though it's really wide and I have the steering at full lock, I still have to do a three-point turn. So definitely the rear axle steering helps reduce the turning circle, but it's not by that much. And in the end, it does still feel like a big car. It's long, it's wide, but it's not, you know, it's not that bad, but it's definitely more than um, perhaps um, a different car, a smaller car, of course. On city streets like this, with some bumps like that, it does filter into the cabin a little bit, even though this car does come with the air suspension. Um, I think I got a good take a right turn, so I'm gonna go here. Even though it does have air suspension, it still filters some of the harshness of the road into the cabin. And you can change the suppleness of the um, suspension using the different driving modes and in fact if you have it in say sport plus mode you can still have the option to manually change the uh, suspension back into comfort so now we're on some more open roads it's a little bit smoother the surface and yeah the car does feel a lot more comfortable but it's not 
as luxurious or you know it's not as supple as perhaps you would expect it to be with a uh, air suspension navigation by the way working really well with the voice commands and the audible um, instructions it works really well you also have a heads-up display and you can also put the navigation on your um, screen on the dashboard as well so with all of these different options the navigation is really easy in comfort mode the engine is a lot more smoother the throttle response is dulled so it doesn't give you any jerky movements although in a start stop city traffic that we that I was driving earlier in um, in Austin Texas where I am right now it did feel a bit abrupt it did kind of you know shoot forward and you had to hit the brakes a lot harder and it was not as smooth and as comfortable even in the supple comfort mode steering is also a little bit lighter the gearbox shifts up like right now even though I'm going 43 miles an hour it's already in seventh gear so it um, it makes it a lot more smoother in fact the engine can also shut off four of its cylinders and just run on the other four cylinders to improve economy you also have adaptive cruise control a lane keeping assist which with steering intervention so it will steer you in lane you also have um, front assist in case of emergency braking the car will automatically sense that and brake as well and you can see the steering is also not that auto is autonomous but it still is definitely very helpful apart from that wind insulation and noise insulation is pretty good even though um, this car has a lot of sound deadening some of the road noise on rougher surfaces does filter into the cabin and that's perhaps because of the fact that this car is running on slightly low profile tires but inside it is pretty hushed there's a lot of plush materials around you so that definitely helps in acoustic uh, damping visibility is I would say adequate it's not great because of the very sleek body uh, body line and the roof line being so low visibility is yeah it's so so front visibility is good side visibility is pretty good but because this side door is fairly small the B pillar is right here so it's obstructing my 90 degree angle view so yeah you have to rely on the mirrors but thankfully the mirrors are really large you have a lot of assistance systems as well like for example all, there's a lot of cameras for a top-down 360 view front camera view, front view uh, rear view as well as things like blind spot monitoring so overall visibility is not that great but you have a lot of assistance systems which make up for it Now we're out on the highway, so let's talk a little bit about how the car behaves out here. I'm just gonna switch lanes. The steering intervention is a bit weird actually because when I'm trying to change lanes and I have the indicator on, it still kind of fights me. It still wants to keep it in lane. I can turn it off, of course, but it's a little bit hit and miss in the sense that it should deactivate temporarily when I'm trying to change lanes, but it kind of fights you. But otherwise, as you can see right now, I'm going around a gentle right-hand bend and the steering intervention, lane keeping assist system is working really well. And um, yeah, it's really useful. Of course, after some time, you get a notification that you have to put your hands back on the wheel. The fuel consumption, by the way, is about 11.8 miles per gallon at this moment. But we were driving on some twisty roads and we were filming, so I was going back and forth in sport mode. So if you drive with a heavy foot then it's going to be this much but if you are going on the highway like already it's 11.9 around 12 i'm sure you'll get a lot more higher mileage and like i mentioned there's cylinder deactivation as well and coasting and features like this which will help ever so slightly on the long run to increase efficiency apart from that let's talk about the seat comfort and the truth is it's a little bit firm for my taste these are the extra sports seats the optional upgrade and I would just stick to the basic seats that come with the AMG four-door coupe because I think that would be a little bit more comfortable this doesn't have too much padding yes the side bolstering is a little bit better and it's gonna help out on the racetrack but on a day-to-day -day 
driving, um, uh, you know, a regular d uh, uh, driving scenario, it's still a bit too firm and it's going to make you feel uncomfortable after a few hours on the road. But very composed, very uh, confidence inspiring. Of course, if we're in Germany and you're on the Autobahn, this is a Autobahn missile, you can go really fast and again be very confident and um, it has really good steering feel as well, it doesn't buff it around, it's got really good road grip and of course thanks to that extra weight nothing really unsettles this car that much. The noise is now a little bit higher than it was before but I think it's okay. I wish they could maybe improve that a little bit considering that this car is still supposed to be a blend between being a luxury car and a sports saloon. I think it should be a little bit more um, quieter on the inside but it's definitely not bad. I'm just really nitpicking here. So with that let's go out now finally onto the Circuit of the Americas F1 track and put this car to the test and see how it behaves there. All right, guys, you join me on board the AMG GT four door coupe GT, oh, sorry, 63S on the Circuit of the Americas racetrack so let's do a hot lap and see how we do and try to analyze the car on the straightaway I'm going 125 130 uphill the car is shuddering a little bit but I suspect that's because at this press event with so many different drivers the tire air pressure has changed a bit I'm in race mode with the traction control on the sport mode so that is partially off not completely off now we're coming into some chicanes and s-bends the car does handle its weight pretty well and thanks to that torque vectoring formatic all-wheel drive system the car does rotate so very nicely and of course i am really at the ragged edge of grip when it comes to this car at these speeds on this track and i can see that while the car is incredibly well balanced it does tend to understeer when pushed really hard but of course if you are going to be driving an AMG on the track this is perhaps not the best track AMG out there the standard GT two-door coupe is perhaps better but otherwise this car still does a great job steering is really good gives, gives really good feedback ah the torque vectoring diff throws power to the rear to give you a little bit of oversteer when you need it to go around corners like that. Now we're on the straightaway high speed section of the track, 130 miles per hour, 140, hard braking over here, brake feel is really good, brakes in a straight line. I do believe there is a little bit of problem on this race car um, in terms of the wheel balancing, but dives in very nice, part throttle on the on the exit, control that oversteer, trail brake into this corner, apex there, gently power on. The engine sounds so nice as well, a very linear power delivery, perfect for racetracks like this, that in the automatic D mode, it's not as intuitive as I would have liked. Like right here on this corner, it's a very complex multi-apex, really long right-hander and I'm, I'm lifting off the throttle every now and again and I would not like it to shift up, which it would have done in the regular D mode. So it's better to keep it in manual. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. This is also a really, really great track. Let's go up the hill again, 100, 120, 125, 130, brake hard on the brakes, ABS working really well to make sure I don't lock up the wheels, downshift very easily with the paddle shifters, nice apex right there, roll on the gas, use engine braking and to balance the car around this right hand turn. Yes, 
weighs 2,000 kilograms, this car, it's hard to believe at times. <laughs> I think I'm getting a bit too close to the guy in front. Of course, I'm not really pushing this car or myself to the limit. This is still a press event and these are still press cars. I'm not allowed to go crazy and potentially damage them. So let's keep it within safe limits. The suspension, while it's still in the race mode, I don't feel that it's incredibly stiff. And on the radio, you can hear now that it is time to wrap up my test track experience on the, uh, rather the racetrack experience with the GD63S. So, what can I take away from this? Well, I think it's a great balance. Similar to the Porsche Panamera, it is very luxurious on the inside. It is very comfortable. Our, it's, it's comfortable enough out on the road because we did find, like I mentioned earlier, that on some slightly more rough gravelly sections of the of roads, you know, out on the city or on some country roads where the pavement might not be the best. There is a little bit more noise in the cabin. There is a little bit more uh, rough edge that filters in through the air suspension. But on the whole, it's not too bad. And on the, on the, on the, on the highway, because the highway surfacing is usually a lot more smoother than city roads, it doesn't really feel bad at all. It is very much comfortable. And on the racetrack, it's still very smooth. It's still very comfortable, though it is in its stiffest setting. Steering is good. The gearbox works really well. Although when you really want to take it to the limit on a racetrack, it's always better to just keep it in manual because you know better than the um, than the uh, the gearbox would. So in that way, it's better to keep it manual. But apart from that, it works really well. Steering is great. Engine, <laughs> again, I can't come back. I can't. I cannot uh, understand. 900 newton meters of torque. Wow. And I can really feel that on this racetrack. It is an exhilarating experience. So this car, the AMG GT four-door coupe, you can go on a nice family holiday and also take it to the racetrack and have a bit of fun. Let's summarize today's episode of the AMG GT four-door coupe 63S 4Matic Plus that we drove. Well, the 43 starts at 95,000 euros. The 53 is about 110,000 euros. The standard 63 starts at 150,000 euros. And the 63S is about, it starts at 167,000 euros, but with options, it can easily touch and cross 200,000 euros as well. A pretty expensive car, but at par with its competitors like the Porsche Panamera. So, what do I think? Well, I think it's a really great combination. It is a beauty and a beast with these elegant lines, but at the same time also has that aggressive touch. The uh, four, four liter V8 by turbo engine can also be very docile and quiet while going on the highway, shut down four of its cylinders, become very economical, but at the same time on the racetrack, it can become a growling beast. The space on the interior, I think is a little bit disappointing. I wish it was a little bit more spacious, considering the fact that this is supposed to be a four person family uh, super sport um, sedan. I think that way as well, the Panamera might be a little bit bigger. Also, the interiors are really cool, but I wish some things were still, you know, changed. Like for example, I still wish the displays were uh, touchscreen. I hope they change that. And the volume knob on the center console uh, is a rocker and I would prefer to have a knob. But these are fairly minor niggles, except for perhaps the space in an otherwise very well-rounded yet expensive package. So you should definitely keep this in mind if you're in the market for this kind of a car. Let me know what you guys think, put your comments down below, and I'll see you guys next time. Also, 
be sure to subscribe to our Instagram and Facebook page. We do some special episodes. For example, recently I drove a 1997 BMW Z3 2.8 in the Creme 21 Youngtimer Rally. And I made a small video, a review of that car, but it's only available on these two platforms. It's still free, it's still fun. Be sure to go and check it out as well. Thanks, I'll see you guys next time.